Okay, so I'm delighted this morning to welcome um, Saffron, who's going to do a presentation for us on our If Only We Could Make Better Use of Our Buildings. Welcome, Saffron. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us more about, um, about your role? Yep, yeah, sure. So um, I'm Saffron. I go to North Street uh, Congregational in Taunton. Um, at the moment, um, what I'll do actually, I'll pop up on the screen, I'll do my share screen and you can see my little slideshow because that yeah. might be best. Um, okay. So, um, I was asked to uh, be part of this because of my knowledge and experience. Um, so I have studied construction for seven years. Um, I did my degree in building, surveying and the environment. And I then have um, done all the below. So I've done um, mortgage valuations and home buyers and defect analysis. And um, at the moment, I'm actually specialising in subsidence. So talking about the problem of trees, um, I actually spend most of my day trying to deal with that at the moment. So that's a good point to remember. Um, so uh, the photos, the top one is uh, my little baby. That is my barn that I am working on. Uh, so quite a few of the photos or some of the plans are of that barn because then I don't have problem sharing it. Um, the building below I was looking after for just over a year and it is twinned with the Houses of Parliament and it was built and designed by the same people. Um, so I can do everything from a rickety old barn through to <laughs> quite nice buildings. <laughs> um, so just looking at what you can do to use your buildings better, quite often um, I think that it actually, sometimes you need building works or you need some sort of adaptions made to potentially use them better. Um, or in fact, just find out where is not being used currently to the best possible, uh, you know, doesn't have the best use yet. So um, what I have been asked to go through is just go through some stages to find out exactly where in our buildings we could utilise better or what if we do need any building works, where do we start? What happens? Okay, um, so the first <clears throat> thing um, that we need to do. I'll take you through step by step as if I was talking to my mum and grandma about this because they were very very reluctant with the barn. So we'll start at the very beginning um, and go through really basically step by step and hopefully you guys can pick up tips as you go along. <clears throat> uh, the first thing is important is to get a really good idea as to what you want to do and what you want to achieve. Um, I know that some people may want to utilise it better, they might want to get more young people involved, perhaps um, <laughs> maybe disabled access or uh, just renovate the buildings that we do currently have or a, a new build to uh, start the new church. Um, so there are a couple of key questions. Um, which will really depend, the answers on this will uh, define exactly how you're going. If it's a long-term project or a quick fix, uh, that makes a very big difference in the standard that you're wanting and the sort of solutions um, and just what you want to achieve and potentially who the main contact will be for this. Um, Existing use, uh, if you want to use your property better, I really strongly recommend um, drawing out a floor plan of exactly what you have at the moment, um, preferably measured and with some sort of a scale, but it doesn't have to be. Um, as you can see in the picture, they have put a dot on um, each time someone has stopped and stood in their building. And I think from experience, I know that actually 
there are quite a few areas in our buildings that we think are used a lot um, that actually aren't and it, it can highlight areas where might you put a um, store for the prams for the um, mums and tops where might you uh, put a storage cupboard etc that's it's really useful to see exactly what is being used and where and if there's anything that we could use better um, so there are things that once you've got to this point that you need to do find out a bit more about your building and the location um, the congregational federation um, or the trustees of your church will really want to know what's happening they'll want to be able to provide the support um, for any works we also need to find out about the more uh, legal side of things is it a listed building um, and if it is a listed building a key point is that it is not just word for word what is written on the listing it, it encompasses absolutely everything in that building so for example you can say I want to take out the pews because um, it just limits how we are using our space although they're not necessarily specified they are included in the listing of that building so we do need to be quite careful as to what we do and who we consult about this to make sure we're not finding ourselves in trouble for just removing the pews for example. Um, another point is if you're in a conservation area so they will control how your building looks from the outside um, and also mentioning the trees are there any tree protection orders that are in so we need to find that out um, historic England slash Scotland slash Wales they have a really great website where you can do a map search and you can find out if you're in a conservation area if it entails so they're a great port of call to find out if there's any regulations on that side about your building that will potentially limit what you can do. Um, I've then gone on to the point of um, once you found out about what you want to do, how it's being used, if you decide you actually need a bit of a shuffle around, you can then use those plans to um, produce a different floor plan and um, I've used in my picture that is my barn and I cut out little bits of furniture that are all to scale and every single member of my family all my colleagues at work everyone that I know friends family they all had to go at moving the pieces of furniture around and creating their own design um, and part of our identity as being uh, congregationalists is that we all want to have a say. And it's really easy to cut out a set of these and have people play at putting um, onto their piece of paper different ideas of layouts and how they could better use the building effectively. Um, is there a is there an idea that someone's had that you've really not thought about that's actually really clever? Um, the important thing then is once you have got a whole raft of different ideas, putting them all out onto your table, having a good search through, what actually works and what doesn't? Has anyone come up with the same ideas? Where might um, the services run? So for this project, and um, you can see that actually the uh, toilet sink, shower, and then the kitchen sink are all in a really close proximity to each other, which means that actually there's minimal um, plumbing works that's required for the whole building. Um, so I would actually say that this is a really key point um, that everyone can get involved in, no matter how old they are. It's like playing a game. It's like playing grand designs uh, that you can just set out your own uh, little layout. Once you've got to this point you know what you're doing, you've got a plan, 
you know that you do need something different you know that actually you've got a really good idea of the layout do you need any planning permissions or any approvals um, so there's two stages to this there's planning permission which goes through the planners and then there's building control um, which are different as well they're different parts they're all part of the council um, but they're two different elements to this that cover different things. If you're thinking of carrying out works to a manse, so a residential property, there are certain works that you can actually do that do don't require any of these permissions, um, so they're under um, approved developments that you can do, so um, adding garages or porches you don't necessarily need any approvals for that um, so it's to look at then exactly what you need to do at that stage um, to make sure you've got everything in place so then by this point we should have a clear idea of carried out a analysis of the existing ideas for the new floor plan know who you're going to contact, know what permissions you need. Um, you may well have only got to the first couple of points and think actually we can reuse what we've already got, which is a great point to have if you can. Okay, um, and then you're on to the point where you might need to be drawing up more formal plans or getting any permissions. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour on exactly the stages um, to get you to the point way before you instruct anyone, before you spend any money that you don't need to, before um, any of that points. So there we go. Back over to you, Yvonne. Okay, thank you, Saffron. Oh. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so uh, are there any questions at this stage for um, Saffron, who's given us a, uh, uh, make it sound easy on, on, how we, on how we maybe start to look at a change in the layout of the building. Are there any questions that we have initially for Saffron? <clears throat> no. No questions? Well, yeah, well, well, sir. Yeah, well, it, it, I was just waiting for people to have questions, Saffron. I didn't want to you know, jump in, but nobody's come up with one. It, so what I've got, what I'm asking now is not a question as such. It's I'm wondering if it might be possible uh, for you to show us again that first floor plan you did with the dots on it, because that really grabbed my attention. I've seen lots of floor plans, as we all have, but I've never thought of doing one with, if you like, you know, footfall. Yeah. I, I don't know if I, you know, I don't want to take up time that other people don't want to, but if, if, if there's a minute or two, because I think that, that was a very helpful bit, if you could share it again. Sure. Um, and explain a little bit how that was done as well. Hmm. Okay. So, um, this one, so the, the drawing is of a, um, of a house and it's got all the layout in there. Um, so over the course of a day or a week or so, you can um, sit or make a recording on a Sunday, potentially. Where do people walk in your church? Where do they actually go to? Where do they actually use? Um, you can draw that by dots or by lines, showing path of travel. Um, you can see in this plan, that actually there's quite a bit of dead space in their dining room that they've got there that they haven't actually used that particularly. So what could they do to use it better? Um, I did a very similar exercise when I was designing a, um, a dining room for, um, I think it can cope with 1,200 people. Um, actually thinking about, so they collect their food at one point, how do they walk through, where do they find their tables, and then what do they do with their trays, what do they do with their food after they're done with it, how do they exit the building. Um, it's just a really visual way 
of highlighting exactly where um, is or isn't used in your building. I think that actually um, it can be quite surprising that you think, oh, everyone loves using this area or that area. And you potentially look at it and you think, no, not many people actually have used it. Um, <clears throat> You know, if, if that was my property there, I would be tempted to uh, knock out a few walls and open up the dining room because it's not very used and see if we could put something in there that's a bit better and a bit more welcoming. Yeah. Um, so, I suppose that's the point. I mean, this is obviously a snapshot, as it were. And, sure. and therefore it might not be representative, but say that was fairly representative. Yeah. The dining room might as well not be there. Mm -hmm. It may, yeah. It's exactly. just wasted space. But look, there, there's hardly anybody in the living room. Well, certainly yeah. not up where the sofa and the chairs are. You know, there's more going on around the piano. But that would be quite a telling diagram, wouldn't it, if that was actually typical of, let's say, a month, in, you know, in the life of a family. Sure. Sure. And that is that is the same with our churches as well. Um, I know in my church, the number of people that use upstairs in our church, we've got massive amounts of offices. Um, we've probably got one or two people that use the upstairs offices on a regular occasion. How could we use those rooms better? How could we, you know, they're effectively sat there empty. What can we do in those rooms to make better use of them? Yeah. Yeah. Yvonne, could I just ask uh, another uh, question, please? Of course you can, please do. Um, I'd, well, first, I concur with Walter. Um, the snapshot would have to be over a period because I can think of, mm. of our church on Sunday. The worship space is absolutely used to death and nothing else in this COVID time. The rest of the week, the worship space is empty and the other rooms are used to death. So it would have to be kind of a, a month or day by day thing. No, the question that I have got was... Um, you mentioned listing and listed buildings. Two things, how easy is it? What's the parameters for getting a, a building listed? Um, how easy is it? Is it, do it have to be a certain age or have a certain significance? And the other thing, being a Yorkshireman, I've got to ask this, does it attract more potential funding and grant work? Um, okay, so to... Let's think. Um, so to get a property listed is normally it's of um, local or national historic interest or of uh, merit. I personally would not go out of my way to get a property listed um, because when that happens, then there are certain restrictions that are placed upon that building that you then can't. Uh, or you find it very difficult to alter and amend um, without having to go through the processes of talking to um, English Heritage or whoever it is to get that done. Um, on the side of funding, I've not, um, they may be able to help with funding, but I've not seen a huge amount of grants available for that. Um, I know that there are some, um, like the like lottery funding as well has helped some old buildings. Um, but in my personal opinion, I wouldn't go out of my way to get a building listed. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Saffron. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, of course, Jill. I, I'm sorry, I didn't see the beginning. I couldn't get on again yet with my computer, so I've had to go to my iPad, so. Oh, um, sorry. It's no, it's I don't know what's wrong with it. Anyway, mine is just quite a simple question. Um, Ruscombe, the schoolroom is listed by association. Is that exactly the same as an ordinary listing? Um, I believe so. Right. So the same conditions then? I believe so, yes. Oh. Um, Actually, if you if you do speak to um, English heritage or Scotland and Wales, no matter where you are, um, they they are 
encouraging in if you have a sensitive project that you want to carry out or that will preserve the life of the building they are actually quite amenable to trying to help you find a solution um it's just you get into a bit of a problem if you don't really approach them first um it's it's um some people say it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission but it's not the case with <laughs> listed buildings uh, they definitely <laughs> like you to ask for permission first <laughs> Right. Thank you. <laughs> Is that the right answer, Jill, or not? <laughs> I think so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Okay, thank you very much, Saffron. Um, if you could stop sharing for me, that would be great. Okay, we've, we've also asked... Um, Sally Fogan to come and present to us this morning. Um, Sally's um, been involved in lots of project management work and uh, even televised, haven't you, Sally? <laughs> uh, Sally is also a member of um, Southam Congregational Church in the Southwest Midlands. Um, Sally, thanks for your time this morning. Will you share with us now about your experience and some of the skills that we're going to need um, or the skills that we, we need to find? If yeah. find. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Um, Do you want yeah. me to share your presentation? Yeah, I've just got a few photos really to go with some of my okay. points. Okay, bear with um, me. I'm not a project manager. I have no um, qualifications in building or project management and ended up managing a building project for restoration by accident. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that and some of the things I learned along the way about the skills that you need to manage a project. And also not so much skills, but kind of personality traits um, and attitudes, I guess. Um, I don't have any of them. It certainly, well, certainly didn't have any of them necessarily. Um, I don't have all of them now and to find somebody with all of them you'd be very lucky in, a, in the church to manage a building project but just to uh, talk about my experience of restoring these buildings so um, we started we bought an old building so it dates back to the 1600s it's a Tudor timber framed house behind yeah. you. you let me know when you want me to uh, oh yeah you just want to go to the first one yeah it's behind you isn't it that's a beautiful well, that is it. yeah that's behind uh, you. in fact that was painted by russell gregory who um ian gregory obviously from newcastle so that's his son <laughs> that house <laughs> and a few links there um yeah so the house is in a conservation area it wasn't listed it's sort of been under the radar i don't think anybody knew how old it was um, and we set about putting the plans together and got all of that in place, appointed a building company, a uh, heritage building company, who were going to do the build and manage the project. And in the course of doing all that planning, we had an email from somebody saying, are you interested in, it was a production company, are you interested in finding out about the history of your house, which we were. Um, but it ended up being a little bit more about us and the project and it was um, a restoration home. Um, followed it which actually was good because it gave us a deadline so we knew that every time that the film crew came we wished that we'd got something to tell them so it actually I think helped us move the project on a lot quicker than we would have done uh, so the top left picture is us at the beginning and the bottom right is how it looks today so we did get to the <laughs> end eventually um, but it it took quite a lot of um yeah and um, emotional input, financial input, stress, and, and all of the things you expect from a, uh, a project. Um, but the first thing I think that you have to have managing a project is you have to believe in a vision. You have to believe, and at all times, because people will throw things at you, at times you'll think that it isn't possible, you'll come against all sorts of challenges along the way. Other people try and you know change, change your views or change what, they think you should do. Um, so I think being firm in knowing what you want at, to achieve at the end is one of the most important things when you're managing a project, um, especially with an old building or making big changes. So that that was my first, um, that would be my first thing to, 
have as a project manager. The second one um, is really to involve other people. And I think particularly for um, churches as community buildings, there are lots of people interested. There are lots of people who are interested in old buildings generally, lots of people interested in, in seeing things change and knowing what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I think it becomes a community thing. This is an old building, it's quite um, prominent in the town. So there was a lot of interest as the scaffold went up and, and people could see things changing, a lot of nervousness about what we might do to it. So by involving other people, not just in the build, um, I think you can generate quite a lot of support and encouragement. Um, involving others in helping them, my girls helping the carpenter. So it's, it's good to get people on site, see what's happening. Um, you know, build, um, building relationships with people and building control and the planning department. Um, and also, you know, sort of sharing the burden a little bit. So um, by letting people know what's happening and getting involved, you can, you can get advice and all sorts of encouragement along the way. And then, um, yeah, so we've got a local heritage society. So they were very interested and have been helping us do research the history of the house alongside the build. We've had local schools around when they've been doing projects about building and it's a little picture that one of them did in a letter. Actually, the thing they were most interested in was the cow bone that came out of the cellar, nothing to do <laughs> with the building. But yeah, so it's nice to, to make it a community project. Is there anything that you'd think of to invite the schools to come in if you were having some building work change within the church building or within a within a house like that? So that's a really good idea of reaching. Yeah. So they things. do. A, they do. A, I think it's like year two. Do a project every year about how how buildings are put together. Yeah. And in this one, it's very clear to see. You know, it's it, it is just like a big jigsaw, and you can show them where the carpenter marks join the timbers together, and they can see yeah. the different materials. So. Yeah, it was, it, that's been good. So we've done that every year. We had a little group round. They obviously couldn't come in this time, but lots of things to show them and get hands on building. And then they learn a little bit about history of the town as well. The place as well. Interesting. Yeah, so that's that one. And the next one I think is really important is just good communication skills. So working with so many different people, um, you know, builders, planning, local people, um, you know, negotiating things, um, yeah, negotiating, there's lots of tension sometimes, um, and you've got different groups of people that you actually want to work together who maybe haven't done before. Uh, so I think that's one of the most important things, you know, keep talking to people and get people talking to each other, uh, knowing what's coming next, knowing the plan so that everybody knows where they fit into it. Um, so that's, I think one of the most important qualities you need. Uh, the next one. Yeah, so this, this is definitely not one of my skills. So we had always planned that there was a project manager that was part of the build um, building company. So I would never, I was never gonna manage this project, um, but very quickly we parted ways with the um, building company who sort of spent all the budget without doing any of the work so suddenly ended up with a house with a very limited budget because it had all been spent and um, all these new things to learn and with an old building you know as much as you can plan everything in advance there will always be something that you know whether it's something to do with the building in this case it was the weather um, when we were doing the roof there's always something that will be thrown at you that you weren't expecting. I'm, I'm pretty certain that in any built on an old building. So, you know, you can plan everything and organize everything and who's coming in when, you know, and you'll get a phone call saying, oh, we want another job, it's gone over. And then suddenly that throws everything out, not just that part of the build. So uh, being willing to be flexible as well and be able to react to change is, is quite a, um, a challenge, but something that definitely usually will have to do um, on a building, an old building. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and just, uh, I think if you're somebody that, you know, has to control everything, you find it very difficult. So that flexibility and accepting that sometimes things will just happen that are out of your control, 
whether it's with people, or the building or the budget, and you know, just accepting that you are gonna have to maybe change vision a little bit or a compromise or you know just go with the flow <laughs> so that's that one and then and managing the budget which is the next thing you know ability to manage budgets and deal with finances um sort of ties back to that so you can have your budget all laid out for all the different pieces of work you can have a contingency but that can very quickly all go out the window if you come across a major problem or, or something like that um so Financial skills and managing budget are important, but also the ability to adapt and, and change them and you know, maybe accept that you can't always have exactly what you'd planned um, because of the situation. The next one, I think, um, there's one, one more on, I think, one of the top. Yeah, the next. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I didn't see the title. Go back again. I think I've got mine in the wrong order. Oh yeah, so I, sorry, I did them the wrong way around. So yeah, being laid back is really hard. Um, and generally I am quite laid back, but building projects come with all sorts of worry and stress and sleepless nights and challenges. And uh, it's, it's sometimes really hard to sort of be relaxed about it and let things happen. But um, yeah, if you're very anxious about things, it, it doesn't help. And it doesn't help you and it, it doesn't help things move forward so these things kind of all tie together but but for me learning to kind of just relax about things go with the flow accept that a solution will be found um however difficult it is um was was quite important learning for me sorry Yvonne, so it's probably two okay. of them, I've done them in the they're, they're quite it's dramatic fun. pictures aren't they you definitely <laughs> need to be laid back when you've got no yeah <laughs> so this that's an illustration really of how you know you you can i mean the house was obviously looked like a house when we bought it and then the more you remove suddenly you're you've got a structure that isn't sound or you know a huge problem with woodworm or something something that's just hidden under the surface so obviously the house didn't look like that when we bought it, but the more we stripped back um, and uncovered things, the more money you need to find to spend to put them right. So, yeah, yeah, that does happen. Okay. Yeah, and that's just ability to manage a budget. Yeah. Yeah, so I talked about that. Yeah, and then uh, the willingness to learn. So, that's my daughter Scarlett on the left with the carpenter when we were working on this house when she was about two. And that's her now working on our next project next door, but one. So we've bought a, a house which we're turning into a holiday, like which is even older than this, dates back to 1550. Um, it's a timber framed house again, but within a sort of Georgian stone building. So it's had a new facade put on. So there were lots of surprises when we started stripping that back. But yeah, so, you know, getting stuck in, learning new skills. So it's taught herself to repoint the walls, which is quite handy by watching YouTube videos. And uh, she's still, there's Brendan then 10 years later, back to help us again. So it's got a more useful help this time, but willingness to learn, not just about, you know, the skills, but about other people and their skills, um, meeting new people, um, finding out, um, doing research, talking to people about who they've used, because finding good people is really the key to any building project. And that's often the hardest thing. And, you know, we learn the hard way. Um, but, and in the end, it, it works out all right. Um, using the same people again. So the second, I can tell you, the subsequent building project you do will be much easier because you'll have made the contacts, you'll have had all the terrible experiences and learnt from them. And it, yeah, you'll have the right people in place and, and a lot more knowledge at the end of the building project. Um, people will say to me, you know, why would you do it again? And in the middle of the first build, absolutely could not imagine doing it again. But by the time you get to the end and it's all done and you've got this new skill set, new knowledge, um, all sorts of new learning, then it, it makes it a lot easier. But that doesn't help with the first, <laughs> I understand. So that, that one. And then the last one, I think, is just to enjoy it. So you've got these amazing buildings and you know we're custodians of them, all these beautiful churches, useful spaces that the community can take advantage of, that we can bring people into, and, and the same houses or any space. And it you know it throws all sorts of challenges at you, but it's such a rewarding thing when you get to the end and you can see the space that you envisaged 
being used as you want and it can be really exciting. So that's what I've got to say. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you so much Sally. Uh, and for those of you that are in the middle, <laughs> be encouraged when you get to the end you'll want to do it all again. <laughs> <laughs> a different way. Uh, okay, have we got any questions for Sally at all? Is there anything you want to ask Sally about those skills that she shared with us? I would um I would just really agree with what she was saying about being flexible. And um I, I think I watched that episode and I think you had to change a lot of the woodwork that you weren't expecting. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I watched it. <laughs> um <laughs> Like with my barn, I put in all my applications because from what I could see, it was a stone barn. And then as I uncovered what was on the walls, I found that actually it's half cob, half stone with cob patching. And then when you're getting to that point, then you're getting to the point where actually people become interested in it because it's an unusual mm. um, type. And I expect you have the same thing that actually having the property listed, although it would preserve what's there, it would really limit as well what you can actually do with it. Yeah, so um, for this building particularly at the time, there was no VAT on listed buildings. So it was that, almost, you know, there was a temptation that's now been taken away. Um, but we also needed to make it into a functioning home for family. Um, and because it wasn't listed, we then had to fit the building to modern building regs so there were things we did have to change so things like the original staircase you couldn't go up without banging your head um because we had to go through building control not as a list of building we had to change the staircase so things like that um so there's quite a lot of differences if you're listed and not listed in what you can do and there are there are definitely benefits to both we'd have liked to keep the old staircase um but we had to fit building regs so yeah, the definitely pros and cons of being listed and a, a lot of the pros were financial and they've now been removed anyway so okay. yeah of course and um i i absolutely with the um getting relationships with all of the people that are in the council and um also talking to other churches and other people and getting recommendations what have you done what what builders did you use were they any good who to avoid um i know that you can then get quite a list of people to avoid and people to actually approach and is that just being open about what you're doing um it, people can recommend all sorts of things okay thank you that's great okay um it's 10 to 11 i think what we'll do is we'll we'll pause for 10 minutes we're going to have a cup of tea uh, or coffee, Walter, <laughs> or hot chocolate. <laughs> and then we'll come back at 11 and then we'll hear three case studies who are in the middle and some of the hints and tips and the, sharing the stories from those churches about where they're up to and um, to encourage and inspire us a little bit more. Okay. Yvonne, could I just yes. ask Sally a question, please? Of course. Um, sorry. Yeah, Daryl, go ahead. Sally, um, when you embarked, did you have a programme of work? and how slavishly did you follow it or not? Yeah, we did. So um, my brother-in-law had done the plans, but he's based in the States. Then we had a UK architect to um, put the plans through. Um, and then we had appointed the builders. We had a very detailed plan of works. Well, not very, we did have a broad plan of works. So we knew that we were, we were stripping out a lot of the modern stuff. We would uncover lots of things. Um, but the, our problem was that the person who dealt with us at that point with the building company then didn't have any real involvement, would just maybe come to site once a week and left so one of these young lads as project manager who had no insight into the budget or had any awareness of any of those conversations um, earlier on. So um, we did have a plan of work, so we didn't stick to it at all, <laughs> really. Um, there were so many surprises along the way and so many um, budget challenges that, yeah, so, you know, we got to the end, so we did broadly follow the plan, but um, we had to take things a lot slower. We had to make a lot of compromise. Um, we had to sort of stop work to try and 
find some more money to do the next stage. So yeah, it, it didn't go very smoothly. But it's Thank you. Did is it to have a plan of a plan? Well, what what was <clears throat> so we did two phases. So we did the restoration of the original house, and then we put quite a, a big modern extension on the back. And um, the difference in the experience is vast. So the new build. We had a very detailed schedule of works. Uh, we had very detailed costings. We had timings and everything followed that plan. Uh, I think just the difference between dealing with an old building and a new build is, is drastically different. So the experience of the new build was, was great. You know, it, it went exactly to plan, exa pretty much on budget. The only surprises are when we were sort of digging below ground for the foundations. Um, and everything else went really smoothly. So there's, there's definitely a difference between dealing with an old building, I think, and, and a new one. Brilliant. Okay. Any more questions or are we okay for a little break? Okay, we'll have a we'll have a break till eleven and then we'll come back and we'll hear from David first about Timperley and what you're up to there. Thanks, everyone. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Thanks for that, Saffron and the shocking trees. <laughs> okay, we're going to have three examples now of churches who have taken that step of deciding to look at changing and developing their building um, and are just in that those early stages or in the middle of not finished. Um, so, David, we're going to go to you first in Timperley, please. Thank you very much. I apologise for not having any whizzy slides and that too, just stuff to... No, uh, it's not needed. <laughs> I've got um, a couple of... Uh, well, well, I've actually got a booklet, which uh, I don't know if I can share that with you. Yeah, I can see it. Pre-planning design pack. A, a whizzy booklet. We started in... March 19 to um, look at the church buildings and decide how we could best utilize them. Our buildings are used Monday to Saturday. The only space that isn't used is the church because we only use that on a Sunday, but all the other rooms are used. Um, so we decided what's the best way of utilizing these rooms, utilizing the church because we've only got a membership of 35 We've got a building that can hold 250. So we've got a huge building that is quite dormant for most of the week. So we wondered, is there a way forward where we can reduce the size of our church building and then utilise what the other buildings we have? In March 19, I spoke to one of our members who's a, um, an architect, owns his own company, has done for 40 years. Um, he lives in France, but he comes over to the UK once a month to... Uh, continue his work there. Um, I had a 10, 15 minute conversation with him. And the next time he came over, he came with a load of plans. Um, he, he brought a nice uh, pack, which showed our floor plan of the church. And we then had a meeting with the deacons to decide the vision going forward and how we can uh, best use all the site. And quite quickly, we ended up with a a plan like that which was cutting the church current church building we have in half putting an extra putting a floor in so we have a two two stories at one area which could be used for community involvement used by the uniformed organizations one of the the visions we decided was we'd make this complex more community uh, based so the cafe area where we were looking to put in wouldn't be run by the church we would ask businesses if they would like to come and run this community cafe um, which would therefore free the church members up to do church work and let the somebody else if you like take the risk of running a cafe for the community we also looked at removing two of our existing buildings um, and selling the land off to a building developer to put old people's flats, I don't think you're allowed to say old people's flats, f flats for people of a certain age um, <laughs> in the space. And one of those flats we would use as a manse 
and therefore we could sell the manse and use the money from sale of the manse to fund our project work. Um, our architect, because he is well known in this area and he's got a lot of contacts in this area, pretty quickly um, moved forward. And this was probably October after we've been through church meetings, a lot of discussion of what people wanted and get, making sure the whole church community was included. Um, so everybody was on board with what we were doing. The biggest question that everybody asked at every meeting was, how much is this going to cost? Um, and of course, we didn't know how much that was going to cost. So um, we agreed with uh, our architect that he would organise um, a tree sur surveyor to come and look at all the trees around the church. We had um, a full site survey uh, done, so we knew the exact measurements of the existing buildings and all the land. And then using the quantity surveyor and two other contractors, he produced a sort of list of works with approximate costings of how much each stage was going to cost us to work through it. Um, at that point, we did then, we got all that information. And in January 2000, we went to Trafford Town Planners and did, had a pre-plan meeting with them because we didn't want to go too far down this road if Trafford Planning would say, sorry, we don't want you to do that. Now, Trafford decided that our building, as it was built in the 1950s and the style of it, would be deemed a heritage asset, which means we couldn't actually knock the church down and rebuild on the same space. We had to leave the church and the facade as it was. And our windows are the brick um, glass block windows, and they deemed that they would have to stay as well um, because they were of a heritage um, asset, which was a bit of a blow because we wanted to take the windows out and put double glazing in. But they said, no, we have to leave the glass block windows as they are and put secondary glazing in if that's what we wanted to do. Um, so that was a bit of a problem. Luckily, they decided it didn't have full justification to make it a listed building because that would have been a lot more complicated, as Sally was saying. So we got all this information from Trafford and then COVID hit, which didn't help very much um, because well, then we had to stop having meetings and stop going forward. But what the deacons did do is um, we, we paid for um, a, a guy who looked after funding and talk about foot match funding um, with what we could raise for what he could raise to help us with the costs. Um, and again, the fact it wasn't a listed building, they said was a good help because we'd get a, a lot more funding. Um, but that the match funding was always going to be an issue with our members because you can't, we couldn't guarantee that we were going to get the right amount of funding that we required. We also spoke, spoke to um, a, build, a couple of building developers who were quite happy to purchase the land that we were selling to put eight or six apartments on and then give us one of the apartments back, which would also raise a lot more funds. In October of last year, we sent a, a letter out to all our members saying, these are all the issues. This is the full cost of what we think it's going to cost. If we were to sell the manse and get a, a value for the manse that we were hoping, if we could sell the land and get a value and get match funding, that would just about cover everything. The total cost that this came to was £1.2 million, which for a church that's got 35 members and adherents was a bit of a shock to a lot of people. Our architect believes that that is still viable and the funding would be in place or we would be able to get match funding to be able to raise and cover all those costs. We left our church members for, in October to pray about this, think about this. And in January, as we asked them, still not able to have proper church meetings. So we had to do everything by emails and letters and asking them for some sort of decision so we could move forward. 
because to put a full app planning application for form through, we would still have to spend much more money. We'd spent about seven thousand pounds on surveyors and architects so far, and to get a full application through, um, we reckon we needed to spend another um, ten fifteen thousand pound to pay for everybody we needed to uh, pay for because we'd obviously need traffic surveyors to come in because we were going to ch change where our driving in and out of the church car park was going to be. Um, so we were we were asking our church members if we could spend another £15,000 to move forward with this project. In January, when everybody had submitted their response, sadly the response was they were very frightened of committing the church to £1.2 million of spending and committing the deacons who were trustees to the financial burdens that that might entail if we couldn't get the funding and the fund managers wouldn't guarantee that they could get us the full amount of funding if we were looking at three hundred and fifty thousand pound funding and grants um and the the sheer cost just frightened everybody off sadly had we not had covid i think we'd have gone we'd have got they would have passed it but because COVID has frightened so many people and kept us all indoors and seen where buildings and money is very tight given to charities, I think that frightened a lot of people off. So we've got to the point now where we are now looking at reducing uh, our bill or what we expect to do rather than do the whole project, do part of the project. One of the things is we need to do something with our church, which is very big. It's got very damp walls. It, the roof needs attention. The gutters need attention. So we're looking at a much smaller project to see um, if that is the way forward. And we've got to that point now where we're just deciding, drawing up a list of what we desperately need to be done and see how, how we can go about funding that. And um, one of the things our architect says, who is very confident that we would get the funding and rather than only having half a vision, go with the full vision and trust in the people who are the experts. And as Sally was saying about project management, he said one of his guys who came and did some of the work for us, he would project manage it because he's an experienced project manager and the deacons wouldn't then have to worry about is the bricklayer going to turn up on time? Is this going to turn up? Is that that's what the project manager's role would be? And he would he knows the budget. He would project manage it and take all the small decisions or all the worry off the members and the deacons. And he's still convinced that we should go down that route. Um, but he accepts that perhaps we need to just cost out what the smaller changes would be. And he said, you will find out that they will be quite a lot more than you think it's going to be. And taking an extra step to the 1.2 million pound vision isn't that far away. But we're at the stage now where we've spent a lot of money. We've got a lot more money that we think we're going to have to spend to get into a position to decide what we're going to do. Um, but it's been... I think COVID really destroyed some of our thinking and destroyed some of the confidence of our <laughs> members. And to, to give somebody a 1.2 million pound, this is how much it's going to cost. And we've got to raise 700,000 ourselves um, is a big ask of our members and they were slightly frightened. I'm hoping, I personally think we should have gone with the 1.2 million and trusted our vision and trusted what the experts are telling us um, and it's very difficult in zoom meetings and through emails to hear exactly what the experts are saying um, we do we are having a meeting a church meeting next week um because we're allowed to stay in church and have a church meeting because boris has relaxed the rules um so hopefully we can air some of these views and uh, move forward from them. But that's where we're up to. We've spent £8,000. 
got got a massive um, list of projects. We've got some lovely drawings and a lovely vision, and the the funding and the money is just so the numbers are too big for some of our members to cope with. Well, we pray the confidence goes back in that, and I think you're probably right. It's just knocked everyone's confidence, isn't it? Not being together. So we're praying yeah. to that, David. Thanks for sharing. Um, and maybe step by step it will happen uh, in smaller steps but you know it's just highlighting that you know we've got to have that big vision and uh, it, it can happen and it and uh, we just have to keep trusting in that and um, so we'll uh, we'll we'll pray into that later okay thank you for sharing that we'll have some time for some questions but we'll move on now to Rob and Celia from Corfe Castle tell us about what you've been doing and where you're up to with yours please Okay, we're um, sorry the internet went down. That's why we couldn't get back on again. No so worries. Missing... <laughs> I don't think you missed very much. <laughs> I've got it written down, um, so I'll have to read from this. All right. No I problem. Been... Can't remember everything. And if you can hear snoring in the background, we've got Frankie, the well, the French bulldog, sleeping here. So <laughs> we're, not, we're not falling. We're not falling asleep. Um, Right, so a church building. Our church is in the small village of Cork Castle. There are two churches in Cork and they both struggle to get many people into the church. Cork is very popular with holiday makers and in the summer we get visitors coming to our church every week. Church is very old, it was built in 1835, so it's a building of interest to a lot of visitors. And I know that um, many people used to come up to me um, from Cork and they used to, um, they'd say, you know, we don't go into the church, it's old fashioned and um, it's more like a museum. So, you know, that was quite upsetting really that people more or less like to look at it as a, you know, like a historic building. Um, anyway, um, the folk, for some time now, we have been concerned about a crack which appeared above the main entrance of the church. It would seem to be caused by subsidence at a corner of the building Adrian, who was a mission and neighbour at that time, took a lot of interest in this. He introduced us to Saffron at a South West Congregational Church event, and she was very helpful and gave us a lot of support and advice. Sometime later, a member of the church who was dealing with the fabric side of the church got in touch with a structural engineer. They inspected the building on two occasions. They gave us two options. We either point the crack above the porch and put a monitor across, or we check the earth around the church with a series of boreholes. The church decided to go for option two because finding out about substances was very important to us. By the time the engineers got round to doing the boreholes, the church member who was dealing with the building side had left the church, so Rob, that's when Rob got involved. A company had already been employed to bore four holes down into the earth, and after doing this, the three of the holes turned out to be normal, whilst the fourth hole situated near the entrance to the church turned out to be very wet at all levels. They recommended that the church be underpinned at that corner. We didn't have the finance at that time. We were also going through a difficult and unsettling time, losing our mission enabler and others leaving the church too. And of course, as everybody knows, we haven't got a pastor there. So at that time, nothing was done about the crack, but we were assured by the structural engineer that it was safe. A while after this, Rob and I were talking to a Christian friend about the problems with the building. He told us that he worked part-time for a builder who specialises in listed buildings and who has done a lot of work for the National Trust. We made contact with this builder and he met up with us at the church to inspect. He recorded everything that required attention. He also said that it was obvious the church had been neglected over the years and work on the church had been patched up using sand and cement instead of lime mortar. And, and this, is, this was years ago. Top of our list of, and our immediate concern was to have the crack pointed and the monitor fitted across it. The other things that needed doing was the coping stones at the gable ends. They needed pointing as water stains could be seen on the inside of the church. Leaks were very evident looking inside the church. The church windows also need sealing. There was also a lot of pointing needed to be done at some stage around the church building, but this wasn't so urgent. We instructed the builders to do all the work necessary to make the building watertight as well as sorting the crack out. Before the builder could proceed with this work, he advised us to get the guttering done at both sides of the church as it was in bad condition. 
That work was done last November. The builder then had to wait for the frost to go before he could do anything with mortar. Work has now been started. The builder and his team started on Monday, gone, and have been working all this week. They gave priority to the crack above the porch. They have cut back either side of the crack between the stones and put six stainless steel dowels across the crack. And this has been pointed with a monitor fitted across it. Also, the porch beneath the crack has been pointed up and sealed. And this will also have a monitor fixed. This is the main entrance to the church. So this is where we are today with the church building. Regarding the finance, we miraculously let the man's cottage around Christmas 2019. It was a miracle. We thought it was a good idea to do it, but hadn't taken any steps to do it. But a lot of prayer went into this. A letting agent from a nearby village approached one of our members and said she had a homeless couple with a baby looking for accommodation. She knew the family so she could vouch for them. And this was amazing. The timing was perfect. Only God could have planned this and his timing is always perfect. Not only this, but the agent helped to get the cottage up to standard for letting and the first month's rent was used for this purpose. So we didn't have to pay anything. And this is how, this is a, this is how we know that God has got a plan for the church at Paul. Um, pews. Adrian, our mission enabler, pointed out how much better and more useful the area inside the church would be if we remove the pews. We would be creating more space, which, which would open up more opportunities for the church's use within the community. It also creates opportunities for outreach activities. The pews within the church can be uncomfortable for some and can be restricted for those with wheelchairs or other disabilities. Um, when, when you talk to people, you've got to you, you tr turn around and you know, you, you've got to stand up and you've got to walk over to the person to talk to them. Um, it's hard, very difficult to, to communicate in a, with, with the pews in, in, the, in the church as it was. And we already had people interested in using the church. So removing the pews would benefit us tremendously as the Lord seemed to be guiding us to engage with and serve the residents of Corf. We researched the market to find the best price for the pews, but found there was little interest in them. We did eventually find a company called Church Antiques who offered us the best price, which included removing them and transporting them to their premises. It was the latter part of 2019 that this happened. We then got an electrician to make things safe as there were sockets attached to some of the centre pews. Now there are seven half pews remaining and they're not sold. We thought we could put two half pews at the back of the church, two at one side of the church and the other three pews at the other side of the church and then we would put upholstered chairs in the centre of the church. Now planning consent wasn't applied for before we removed the pews. Um, it was the builder who specialised in the list of buildings who pointed this out to us and he asked whether we had got consent to remove them because they'd already been removed and we just went back blank because um, we never thought about it because so many people had been involved along the way. We were you know people came and they left and we were another link in the chain. And I must admit, we have learned a lot since being involved, but at that time, no, we, um, we, we just drew a blank. So we rang Adrian up for some advice on this as he was there at the time, and we thought he might just throw some light on this. Um, that's when we agreed to take the pews out is when you know the Adrian came along and helped us. Adrian was very helpful and advised us to write an apologetic letter to the council describing our circumstances. We wrote to the council and the senior design and protection officer replied by email. She gave us a link to the retrospective consent application form for listed buildings. We filled in a six page form together with photos of the pews in their original position. A drawn to scale diagram of the inside of the church showing the pews in their original position. We had to do an ordinance survey map of the immediate area of the church with the church building outlined. We had to send all copies of correspondence to Dorset County Council, which included the way the church is governed and how the church makes its decisions. We sent them a copy of the relevant portion of our church meeting minutes where the pews were brought up and the agreement to remove them um, as at one of our meetings, you know, with the church, with the members. And we're still waiting to hear from them. But since the application was made, our builder has checked grade two listing for the church and found that the pews weren't mentioned. The builder said that if we hadn't made an application to the council for removal of the pews, they wouldn't have known they were in the, there in the first place. So um, that's something we did learn. Now, 
and we're left we're now left with lots of rubbish and scrap board old carpet in the middle of the church floor we know someone who will disperse of, of this for us very cheaply and um, once that is done and the building work is done we can then get the inside of the church decorated an evangelist who is by trade a painter and decorator will be doing this work our son will be helping to put a floor down we think that it will be a laminate floor and then we will purchase 100 to 150 upholstered stacking chairs for the center of the church. And after that, we follow God's leading. It's quite exciting to see God's purposes come to fruition in Corfe. And to, we, we put this down, all praise and worship go to the Lord Jesus, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, we have nothing, but with him, we have everything. And we, we do put it to God in this completely, from beginning to end. Um, I'll finish with a scripture with a scripture taken from Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Um, if anybody wants to ask, ask questions, Rob, no, Rob will be able to answer these because Rob got more involved. I've been asking him questions and he's been, <laughs> he's been helping me. So he seems to know a bit more about building than I do. So if anyone's got any questions, then... And the other thing, the other thing we did come across is that the um, the um, chap that's the building chap there, he had a look at the, uh, the guttering, didn't he? Yeah. He, look, he looked at the guttering, and he said only a couple of days ago that it was put in. He wasn't very happy because it's that's been put in wrong. Can you explain, Rob, about the guttering? Yeah, apparently uh, the flow wasn't right. And so half of the guttering on one side went down to the end plate and was just filling up. And all they could do was take the end plate off to empty the water. So the actual... Uh, he wasn't happy about that, was he? No, he wasn't happy at all. Because it's got to be done by... So now we have to get back to the uh, people who fitted this guttering, try and get them to sort it out. Whether they will, I don't know. But it's okay. all money, you know. It's all money. Yeah. money. But it's, it's the actual, it's what we should be doing, isn't it? Because you're not allowed, you've got to have a wide guttering, you said, didn't you? Well, originally there was no guttering when the church was built. So guttering, it's a plastic guttering that was up there, which was very bad anyway. And so we asked if we could replace it with a, a, wider, uh, a wider gutter to catch the water because at one point, the water was missing the gutter, coming down onto the wall, saturating the wall, and it caused all, caused all the paint to blister off inside the church. Uh, the gutter we've got now does seem to stop that, but it's the other side that's the problem. Oh, goodness, you've done amazing now with all the things that you've done and you kind of work it towards. And, I've learned a lot. <laughs> it was an important, it was an important message, though, to share about the, the um, permissions and then the process that you had to go and are still waiting through to wait for those permissions. It's like what Saffron said, isn't it? It's the reverse of that. So we'll pray into that, too, as well. Thank you for sharing so much your story this morning. Um, so and uh, I'm sure people have some questions as well, but we'll hear from Adrian first uh, at Stanbourne. Thanks, Adrian. Good morning. Um, Stanbourne has been on an interesting journey. Um, we started off with um, just four people 10 years ago when I joined it with pews in a 1969 building, um, the third building on the site. Um, if you can imagine a building which is just three rooms, so a uh, six meter by 15 meter main room, um, a two and a half meter by six meter kitchen and a toilet out the back. Um, that's basically the building. So it's quite small. And um, we have had 120 people in it, but <laughs> we were really uh, sort of sardines. Sardines. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have the vision um, for the church of being church every day and gathering on Sundays to worship, which means that the vision is saying the building should be used seven days a week. Um, the church should be active every day, one way or another in the community. 
Um, church isn't about Sunday mornings. That's when we gather to worship God. It's the, the church is there for every day. So the, with that vision in hand, we we have a kitchen out the back, and the kitchen was used to produce to put to do meals. We do a meal um, every fourth Sunday. We do a meal with the um, film nights. We do a meal with um, a games evening. We do a meal with um, when we ever have a church meeting. Um, so there's quite a lot of food produced. The problem is the toilet out the back of the church was actually built off the kitchen. And we modified that um, and took away the ventilation corridor. Um, and planning people were perfectly happy with that. But then the um, food hygiene people came along and said, no, you can't have a toilet off kitchen. So we ended up um, having to, um, well, we lost our food hygiene um, and our ability to do food at all. And of course, that's a big part of what we do. Yeah. So what we did was drew up lots of different ways of dividing up the kitchen um, and giving access to the toilets without actually going through the kitchen and modify putting toilets at the back of the building so we came up with about six different plans um put them to the church meeting and the, everybody in the church meeting decided that the plan that we should go for was to modify the church entrance um, which is a very small porch and doesn't face the road or anything it, um, so nobody knows it's a church <laughs> Um, the, the problem we have is that everybody thinks it's a bungalow or the village hall. So we, in the middle of a service, we'll have people turn up for the dog club, <laughs> which is um, a bit infuriating. Um, and whenever we say to people, you know, come to Stanbourne Chapel, they say, well, where's that? So we have the opportunity now to actually turn the porch to face the road and put on it a cross um, and a name of the church. Um, and to put uh, accessible toilets at the back of that and then modify the existing toilet um, to be a store for the kitchen, change the boiler room into an office. We've recently employed a community worker and the community worker is actually um, managing volunteers so we need somewhere secure to actually hold lots of information and we don't have any secure places in the building at the moment. Uh, there's a filing cabinet in the kitchen. <laughs> um, so it'll give us the opportunity to actually build a little office, which means that um, there will be a space for prayers, uh, private prayer, um, as well as storing all this information. So that, that's a fairly comprehensive vision. We're a church of about 20, 20 odd people, um, which has grown quite a lot through the pandemic actually. Um, but we, um, we have a, we, we employed a, an architect to draw up the plan that we eventually decided on. And he had got us through planning permission and through building regs and then having got us through building regs said actually you would need a um, technical guide to actually design all the the, the beams etc and make sure it's all correct a structural engineer and he wanted another thousand pounds for that um, so we put the whole project on hold at the moment because obviously we need to find out how much it's going to cost um, so that we can start the fundraising processes. That hasn't held us back. We had a plant sale last week, a uh, plant swap and sale, and we made nearly £600 towards the building fund, which is incredible. <laughs> it's the most we've ever made out of a plant sale. Um, but that just shows how enthusiastic people have been. And the community worker has made lots of contacts into organisations um, in the villages we serve, because we serve 10 villages. 
um, and all of those villages advertised our plant sale. So you know, we had a, a nice lot of people turned up. So that's where we are. We've got to the point where we're struggling now to make the next step um, to actually raise the funds to get builders to make quotes. That's really hard work. Um, one of them's actually phoned and said, um, oh, no, we don't. We, we can do a quote for you, but if it's competitive tender, we'll have to charge you just to do the quote. And we said, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Um, so at the moment we're struggling to get the quotations, we're struggling to get um, to, to get the next step, to get the structural engineer to go do the sizing of everything and to finalise the, um, the, the design. Okay. So okay. that is where we've got to. Okay, thank you, Adrian. I appreciate you sharing that about where we're up to. So um, when we meet again on um, the 3rd of July, we've got three other churches that are sharing that have completed and that uh, have been through all these little hurdles and have overcome all these um, problems and, and snags that come along the way, as Sally even shared with us before. Has anyone got any questions or uh, is there anything that Saffron would like to input or Sally would like to input on those particular projects that would be helpful and inspiring for others? Please unmute yourself and do if you have. Um, I was going to say about when the builder said, oh, if you hadn't told the council, they'd never know about the pews. Well, whilst that is, you know, possibly true, it's also not exactly the right thing to do. Um, and you are doing the right thing by actually having put in that application afterwards, apologising. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, be encouraged by that, Celia and Rob, yeah. Thank you. I think, uh, Yvonne, could I just say um, one, one thing that was mentioned there a couple of times, has been mentioned obviously, is the effect of COVID uh, over the past uh, 12, 14 months. One effect of COVID as it's made the building trade absolutely bonkers. And anybody looking at a project who's trying to get either a builder or a builder to get some material certainly in Sheffield, down about the rest of the country, but it is mad. I mean, the city ran out of concrete a bit ago. It's run out of plaster. It's, mm -hmm. you know, run out of profile for windows. Uh, so again, that is something just to factor in. Uh, the other thing is to get somebody to come and quote is, is a bit of a miracle. But when they do come and quote, they then say, right, but I'll probably be looking at 12 weeks before I can even think about starting. So suddenly any projects that are kicking off about now are going into near enough Christmas yeah. when the weather's horrible. So I don't know what everybody else finds, but certainly in Sheffield, we found that builders, building material and tradespeople are at an absolute premium. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the reasons or one of the, 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 the main purposes of holding this event as well though, was for us to start thinking as churches and um, we you know because we haven't been in our buildings, what what is it that we want to do with them? Do we want to change them? This is a perfect opportunity to be able to say what is our vision as a church? Um, what, how do we use our church? Because those those um, ideas that Saffron gave us or those plans to initially start just give us an ask start us asking all of those questions so it could be that actually it is just a case of um thinking things through before you even pick the phone up to speak to a builder uh, in in the first place but yeah covid has had and not daryl not just on that building trade but also like david said on people's confidence in in doing things as well okay and okay. um, I, I just want to reiterate as well is that actually there's a lot that we can do and a lot of plans that we can think of and really develop before we even pay anybody to get involved um, and that actually we're you know we're more than capable of looking at our buildings ourselves and 
thinking about what we want to do and developing those ideas before we then go and pay uh, someone to develop that further. There's a bit of encouragement for you that you can do it, you can. Okay, thank you everyone. Comes down to time and money at the end of the game though, I'm afraid. It certainly does, it certainly does. Everything is the same though, isn't it, Daryl? That's, that's what it is. And, it, it, you know, if we think about what Sally said, that was the first thing she said. You've got to believe in it, haven't you? You've got to believe in it and you've got to, you know, you've got to pray into that vision. OK, so we've got a bit of time now on the time time plan to think about uh, an action plan because what we want to encourage you to do is to ask those questions to maybe have a starting point and um, Saffron is there maybe something that you would suggest as a starting point for everybody to go and do obviously uh, everyone that's joined today has got something in their mind about how their building could change or what their church could do for their communities is there a first starting point that we can do other than prayer of course but um something practical that we could take forward as a first point of action plan um i think um the first step would be figure out what your main goal is what is it is it that you want to find out how you can use your building better is it that you've got a problem I know that some churches have got a problem where they've got a um, mums and tots group but they've got nowhere to store the prams and um, is it that you it's know what is the, the big world. what is the big thing that you want to tackle and then I would go into sketching out an outline of where your building is and how it all connects find out exactly on the dots you know where's used where could where could you use better is there any dead spaces that we don't think of at the moment well Ty, do you want to add anything i, I was just thinking it's it's um i mean the, the 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 broad title we gave to this you know event today was you know if only we could make better use of our buildings and i'm just thinking looking forward to the third of july when we have our sort of follow-up sort of, um, couple of hours i'm just wondering if there are any of the churches that we represent here where we're not perhaps thinking of the need to make structural um uh, changes or you know significant structural changes I, I mean when you have to do that you have to do it but you know actually for some for many of our churches i think in the federation mm. it might be more of a case of well, I, you know the, the, the simpler question how do we actually make better use of what we've got you know we may not have to knock down walls or build new walls or build extensions or you know fix the roof but but actually we've, we have got dead space or, or you know we've got you know, some places are too big or we've got too many smaller rooms, you know, we might want to think about knocking a wall down or putting a door through. But but it may simply be, how do we actually make better, you say the sanctuary, you know, the, the, the issue of pews is one that commonly comes up and it was interesting uh, that Celia mentioned that one, you know, um, uh, not Celia, so it was David, wasn't it? No, who no, was Celia. it? It was yeah, so, yes, Celia. I was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's a common one, but you know, but I'm, I, I, I've worked with churches in the past, um, that wanted to get rid of their organ you know it was a church with an absolutely massive you know victorian organ that was taking up masses of space or you know um you know the, the things like that or you know how can we make simply how can we make better use how could we more creatively and imaginatively plan our worship space you know do we do you know do we all have to be facing the direction we're facing now could we think about changing the direction of you know of, of the build of of the orientation as it were within could we, you know, split it up into notional areas so that you've got one big space, but it's almost like stations, you know, like with stations of the cross. Those kind of questions, I think, are also very legitimate. And we might be able to find ways to, you know, things that we've done or seen that we could share together there and um, that don't actually involve, any, maybe not any, but certainly not any significant structural work. Can I come in there? No. Uh, but our building was redesigned 30 years ago as a result of uh, dry rot. And I don't remember God being involved very much in the, in the planning. Uh, and we do have a, a huge dead space upstairs, which we, which we don't use. I, I think our problem is not so much uh, wanting to redesign our building, but how to get people to make better use of our building as it is, as what Walter was, was saying, mm -hmm. I think, uh, that we need 
to attract people in? What who can we attract in, and all that sort of thing? In other words, how can we evangelize better using our present facilities? Okay. It's interesting. Um, at Super Bumster, when I was there, we were due to move, remove the pews, and we are we were going to move the pulpit, and we went round the congregation and said. Um, we're going to move, remove the pulpit, do you mind? <laughs> and our 92-year-old oldest lady who was there at the time said, what again? <laughs> and nobody in the church remembered it being moved apart from this one lady. <laughs> and she remembered it being moved three times. <laughs> so sometimes what we think is fixed in our churches is, uh, is not. It's been moved a lot of times in yeah. the past. Yeah, yeah. And um, and sometimes we're too afraid to to sort of take the steps to move things and change things, yeah. because we think it's always been like that. And a bit of history says no. <laughs> Sandra, um, I'm very interested to know. I think it was um, the man from Temple, eh? David, said your church is used six days a week. What? organizations are using it on the six days a week um we have a mother and toddler group that uses it for four mornings or and three afternoons got a yoga group and men's choir uniformed organizations i was just about to say now covid is letting us all out again we're having discussions with people who used the building prior to covid um to see when they're coming back and quite a few of them have been approached by various community halls and other churches saying would you like to come and use our building now we can all start meeting again and giving them much reduced costs <laughs> um so we're now we're now sort of discussing cost and whilst people didn't or we didn't charge a huge amount for people to use our buildings because we asked them to support us in our other activities and like the men's choir used to do free concerts for us and all the funds that they raised came to the church. When somebody's offering them a building for 12 months for nothing, yeah. you know, we might find they're not going to come back. Yeah. So it's, COVID has sort of driven everybody's, uh, we must get somebody in our buildings to uh, raise some funds. So it's, uh, that's another battle I think we're, we're yeah. about to start having in them. And whilst Walter was saying, it, can we attract other people into the churches and how do we do that? But other community buildings are attracting them by saying we won't charge you for 12 months. So it's, uh, and we've got gas and electricity to pay. And if somebody's using the building 52 weeks a year, there's electricity costs. So uh, yeah. it's, a, it's going to be very difficult to get some of our groups back. Yeah. Mm, didn't realize that that's uh, that's very naughty isn't it i mean how, how they could possibly offer something for nothing in that sense goodness me okay okay so we've um talked big Okay, we talked big about how we can how we can completely change the layout of a building. We've talked about first steps where we can set a plan, we can look at it over time um, and look at those hot spots of where people are. We've looked at maybe how we can then um, change the layout slightly so it's not such a big thing, but it is just about making better use of our space. Um, has that given those of you that have tended this morning some ideas of, of the next step that you might take before we meet again on the 3rd of July. Mm. Hilary? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, Jill, and, Jill and Sandra, has it given you some? Yes, it has, yeah. Have a little yes. think about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nick, you're okay with your trees? Yeah, <laughs> David and Stuart. Yeah, I think I concur with what uh, what Stuart said. Uh, it, it it is not so much the structural side of things that we need to be looking at, uh, but certainly there are areas of the church, uh, some some of which he mentioned the upstairs not used at all, 
others that I'm sure could be used better. But it was interesting uh, what was said about uh, the lady, uh, the 92-year-old lady uh, who, who knew that the pulpit had been moved three times. Because that, that is one of the big challenges that we face, just convincing people that we need to do things differently. We need to change things. Uh, so I'm sure we'll be having those sort of discussions uh, at Green Acres. And I think as well, it's like taking that opportunity that like when we first when we first started to look at Christmas um, under COVID, we said, didn't we, the thought of not having a carol service at Christmas the year before would have been like absolutely yeah. horrendous idea to put forward. And yet it, it, COVID gave us that opportunity of saying, well, we can't do that, so what else are we going to do instead? And I think this is why we felt this is t was timely, Walter, wasn't it, that actually it's just given us that opportunity to ask these bigger questions. Ruth, was a, w have you got something to work on or get you thinking or starting through? Yes, I liked the idea of the floor plan as to how the building's being used. Um, at the moment, as I say, we're not, it's not being used at all. So that might be quite a good starting point. But our, mm. one of our precautions is being a community church. What, do, what groups do we invite into the church that we know are going to respect it and use it safely? Um, but that's something to think about. It has given me some food for thought. Thank you. Okay, no worries, Ruth. Sue, I know you can hear us and, and see us, but you, you can't um, speak. We can't hear you or see you. But if there's anything, if you could... Oh, here, yeah, thanks, everyone. Interesting session. Lots of points to think about. Okay, thanks, Sue. And Jill, was there anything anything for Rushcombe that you feel that you can move forward with? Um. I think it was really useful, actually, you know, uh, for them as well. And you're recording it, aren't you? Amy? I am. And I think it would be really, you know, I tried to encourage them to come on today, but um, they weren't able to. So I think a recording, you know, would be really useful. Okay. Uh, for them to see. It would be lovely. Thanks, Jill. And Daryl? Yeah, it's really, uh, really useful. Thanks. I mean, uh, I, I looked at it from both sides. We've got about 30 grand's worth of work to do down at Hillsborough Tabernacle Church. So there's been real good input from there. And I agree with what Walter said, and that is using the existing space to generate more money to actually pay for the 30 grand's worth of roof. And like Sally said, you, you know, get the community involved, get the community in, get the community involved. Have a plant. Well, we, we, we have. We've been, very <laughs> we've been very fortunate to have the other side of the coin uh, to the gentleman who said that his tenants had been poached in the, <laughs> because other areas had, or other venues have dragged their feet in reopening. We've had a number of people come on our door and say, can we use your facility? And we've been able to say, well, we've got a long queue and uh, she said we've been able to charge accordingly. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we've actually benefited from it. Okay, we'll have to. Uh, we hope that changes as well for Tim Play, eh, David. <laughs> Listen, now, we should, sorry, go on, go on, Jill, go on. Uh, there's been there are a lot of grants available at the moment, post COVID, um, and the community groups are applying for them, but churches can as well mm. if they're using their buildings for community use. But there are. Lots of the councils are actually just giving grants. If you, you know, look into that, there, there are plenty around at the moment. Well, that's really good to know. And actually, that's a good um, intro to what we wanted to share with you, because um, we've been given some funds from CWM to be able to run these sessions where we, and because we've we've done them like this, we've we've also got funds for some grants as well for building projects. So. Um, if if that's something that you need some help with financially, then we can send you the form. Quite a simple, straightforward form, haven't we, John Walter? That um, yeah, yeah. Please do get in touch with us if there's if there's ways that we can you know pass on grant money to you. Please do. The other thing I was thinking was that before the third um, of July, isn't it, that we meet again? Um, if anybody here today has any particular questions, you know, once you've sort of slept in it, maybe spoken to one or two other folk in the church and the like, um, you know, specific questions that you'd like us to raise when we meet next, then 
get in touch with Yvonne or myself as, again, uh, and we'll, we'll pick up as many direct, you know, direct um, points as we can. Absolutely. Thank you. Does anybody know about anything about green grants, green heating grants? You know, they're giving money to houses, aren't they, for to convert to green, to eco heating? Yeah. 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 Does that apply to churches? <laughs> I'll find out. I actually haven't heard about those, so I'll have a little yeah. look. I'll get in touch with um, Russia UK or Eco Church and see whether they, there's anything mm -hmm. in their latest info. Thanks for that, Adrian. I'll have a little think. I know a little bit about those, Adrian, in that there was a grant on recently, but they pulled them. Uh, and that they were, you had to spend a lot of money on insulation. They were primarily for insulation and for the way that your heating was pumped around your building. Mm. Uh, and the grants were absolutely, absolutely they were unworkable um, and they were pulled recently. So that was one of them that was about. Mm. So <laughs> it was heralded as a great thing from uh, the government, but to be honest, it was mad. And uh, they decided yeah. it wasn't a good idea. Um, I would also add with that, I know that about the Green Deal and that actually it wasn't a deal at all, really, for the people that were dealing with it. And um, because we're mainly predominantly dealing with older buildings with more traditional um, building materials, we you have to be very aware that they breathe. So... Uh, like the lime mortar that was talked about and stone and um, timber, they will breathe. We can't just go putting in the plastic um, insulation that's normally used without really considering it because you could actually cause more damage to your building by doing that than just leaving it as it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I think if we're exhausted with them questions, like Walter says, don't, you know, we're still open if things come to you in the middle of the night like they do. <laughs> and you've got a question, then um, I can pass them on to Sally and Saffron too, who um, will be able to support you. And um, we'll just pray into these projects, I think, for Timperley and for Cove Castle and for Stambourne as you progress with these. And, um, you know, we encourage you in that. And then we'll say goodbye. Okay, thanks everybody. Let's, uh, well, we'll, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we just give you this morning these three projects in particular. We, we give you the church at Timperley. We thank you for all the work and Cove Castle and at Stambourne. And we thank you so much for all the work that has happened already um, to make and to give these plans um, a vision and um, a, a project plans in place and we just look to you we give you and um, the plans that there are there and we ask you that if it's your will your will be done in them we thank you for all the people who have been involved and for the skills that are needed and so we just pray for a smooth return from the applications for the plan of permission at Corf for the pews to be removed. We pray that that comes back and that is all okayed. We pray for the first stage of the building for Timperley, that that all happens and that the confidence is built back, built back with the congregation for the full scale project and that your vision and that church is, is a magnet for that community and more people will come back and use it and that loyalty will stay there. And we also pray for Stanbourne and the changes that have been made and that that will all happen smoothly as well. And that although people may come in the building, it will come into worship and not look for other groups, Lord Jesus. So we just thank you for the vision that you give us and that you continue to speak to us on how you want us to be the church just as ourselves, but also to use our building so that our buildings may be magnets to draw people closer to you, Lord Jesus. So we just thank you for this time and for the skills of Saffron and Sally. And um, we love you, Lord, and we praise you and we trust you in the plans that you give us. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. And I will hopefully I'll see you again soon. But if not, it will be recorded.